Welcome everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the first Reckoning Salon Artist Talk presented by the Paul W. Zucare Gallery at Stoller Center. I'm Karen Levitov, Director and Curator, and I'm honored to be joined by our moderator, Dr. Judith Brown Clark, and our panel of faculty artists. The online Reckoning exhibition uh, is a faculty exhibition that presents artwork created in the past year by the Stony Brook Art Department's internationally renowned faculty artists that expresses a range of individual and collective experiences we are living through and the underlying conditions that has brought us to this crossroads. The artists present creative responses to the issues and experiences of our times, including living through a pandemic, issues of social justice and climate change, as well as personal expressions. Links to the Reckoning faculty exhibition and our related Reckoning student digital mural can be seen on the gallery's webpage, zucaregallery.stonybrook.edu. And you can also find a link there for our next faculty salon artist talk, which is on Wednesday, November 18th at 12 o'clock. I'm honored now to introduce our moderator, Dr. Judith Brown Clark. An award-winning thought leader and diversity advocate, Dr. Clark is Vice President of Equity and Inclusion and Chief Diversity Officer at Stony Brook University. Dr. Clark's extensive experience and expertise in, in the area of diversity and inclusion includes directorship of diversity at the Beacon Five Institution Research Con Consortium, where she was responsible for the development, management, and implementation of diversity and inclusion strategies. It is with great appreciation for her enthusiastic participation that I now turn the discussion over to Dr. Clark. Hello, everyone. Oh, my goodness. Am I excited. I've been thinking about this ever since. Thank you so much, Karen, for having this opportunity. I think, you know, when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, fairness, you know, these are very complex things that we're navigating. I can't think of a better way other than using arts, expressions, and so on to really look at the ways of addressing this. I think, you know, it's very emotional. You know, a lot of things that I do, especially around from an administrator, it's like policy and funding and programs and, and looking at, you know, compliance and, you know, all the things that are within a structure. But the creative side, you know, our ability to really express and escape or, or see um, a common feeling, you know, through art in a way that so many diverse minds and, and experiences and opportunities for you artists, you know, both the artists we're going to see today as well as the artists that are, are, are watching, your ability to really have this commonality of experiences is such an incredible blessing and talent. So it is my pleasure, honor to, to, to be able to, to be your moderator today. Just to kind of take you through the program, you've already read it as I'm talking because you can multitask, but um, each artist will take um, about three minutes to really talk about their work and, and really describe it in the way in which they want you to consume it. Then we'll have like a 15 minute conversation dialogue of kind of reflecting, you know, what, what we heard and, 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 and um, just kind of unpacking that. Then you have the opportunity for 15 minutes and that will be moderated by Karen, who will um, then take your questions that you can ask a different artist and get a perspective that, you know, it's important that your takeaway is, uh, is, is, you know, your lens and your curiosity. So that being said, I can't ask you, are there any questions because you're muted? So you'll just have to put, I'll have to assume that we were very efficient and telling you the expectations. And now let me start introducing you to our artist. So our first artist will be Associate Professor Azumi Ashizawa. Ashi Ashi Zawa is a performance artist and theater director whose performance company explores physical storytelling with puppetry and object object animation, often in collaboration with dancers, actors, composers, musicians, and sculptors. Azumi. 
thank you so much for the introduction and uh, thank you um, for everybody, Karen and um, all the gallery staff to organize such a wonderful event. Um, I cried because I had no shoes until is a performance piece commissioned and uh, premiered in Liverpool in the UK last year, June of 2019. And although the piece was created one year ago, the subject matter of the show matches to the idea of reckoning. The performance was a duo show uh, with one live musician on stage. And it was an unconventional puppet performance inspired by the Japanese traditional bunraku puppet theater's invisible puppeteer called Kurogo. In bunraku, Kurogo is dressed in black from the head to toe, and uh, they, they are considered invisible or non-existent in theater code. I adapted this code and put this invisible figure as a main character in my piece. By doing this, I tackle the issue of identity and gender politics. What is perceived as invisible is spotlighted and invisibility becomes, one, um, becomes the core of the story. At the very beginning of the performance, I um, appear as a female character but soon forced to wear head to toe all black costume and turn into invisible character. For the rest of the show until the very last moment when I became a, a female character again, I stayed invisible female and manipulated multiple shoes um, entire time. Um, my co-performer was British male actor who interacted with countless shoes without owners manipulated by myself, invisible female. The gender politics in the invisible female character reflect different layers. In theatrical level, Japanese tr traditional theater prohibits female to perform on stage. Because of this tradition, misogyny, mi misogynistic treatment um, is prevalent in non-traditional Japanese theater as well. And even abusive conduct is accepted. In this context, the act of me playing an invisible female character is a uh, coded resistance. At the same time, it, was, um, it also mirrors historical, uh, histor historically silenced uh, women in social level. Simultaneously, the intentional um, casting of British male actor juxtaposed with uh, shoes without owners evokes the wound, wound of social invisibility and colonization. And um, as a backstory, I would like to share uh, my experience of performing Invisible on stage. I have been animating multiple shoes through, um, throughout the performance. This means I have been walking and running in a squat position for ac approximately one hour, entire time. I have practiced traditional Japanese no theater when I was younger. And one of the walking that I learned was called mosquito walk sliding legs swiftly in squat position with upper body straight. I never imagined this walk would become such a handy tool for, for my show, but it never meant to be for one hour. Thank you. Thank you so much. So you're an artist and an athlete. That is, uh, that, that was very beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next, um, our next artist is Professor Nabuho Nagasawa, an interdisciplinary artist whose site-specific work explores the places, ecology, and psychological dimensions of space and people. She is interested in socially interactive sculpting and exploring concepts concerning society, culture, politics, and memory. Nobi, are you unmuted? Nobi, you're still muted. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, so thank you again for uh, Georgia and Karen putting this very time specific, timely show. And Dr. Brown, thank you for being us, uh, with us today. Um, I think in the context of this reckoning show, rather than focusing on my work 
at the beginning, I would like to uh, talk about the artist and their process of creating this historic uh, record in Soho and a cry for a social change. Um, the plywood first went up in Soho, I think around March, and the pandemic forced the storefront to close and turned the Soho and the Chelsea neighborhood where I live sort of into a ghost town. And then after a spate of looting in late March, I mean, uh, May and early June, June, which followed by the, all the protests that was going on over the death of George Floyd and other deaths, uh, more plywood were put in place to repair windows shattered by looters. And that was all over Chelsea and Soho and other parts of New York. And, you know, it seemed all of a sudden, Soho had, had a new face with the fancy boutiques and all the retail stores turned into kind of an industrial storefront, the way Soho was in the mid 20th century. And that's how Soho became an artist kind of a colony. And as everybody knows, you know, art world was centered in Soho and it kind of died away when all the retail stores started to display beautiful clothing and shoes and as if they were the work of art. But I think in the wake of looting, artists really transformed the plywood into canvases. And I Soho became the destination for artists instead of shoppers for a brief moment. And, you know, I live in heart of Chelsea myself, but I felt as if the whole city were sort of dying of multiple traumas. And it was a very sombering time for all of us. So I think the first thing I noticed was graffiti related to Floyd. Death appeared when I went to one of those marches, uh, several of these marches and protests. Then people started showing up with brushes and paint and turning these blank plywood into a medium for messages. And that was, you know, some of them were very idyllic and then some of them were uh, polemic and very hopeful. But I think what happened was it brought the artists who were in quarantine, probably working from home, to go out on the street and do something together. Um, I have to give a credit to Miriam Novell and artist Maxi Cohen, who came up with this idea to start painting in the plywood and put out a call for artists. And there were nearly 70 artists or images on the first day. And I think on my first day, I collaborated with a Fluxus artist, Jessica Higgins, and she brought the, uh, the front page of New York Times, uh, which included the, the newspaper, you know, the front page, which had um, the uh, death of 100,000 deaths. And then we pasted that together, and then we put up the images of cicadas. And then some of the collaborators who just came by, my friends, I welcomed them to also add some more. And the second uh, time I collaborated, I invited my student, Heather Weston, to come and join. And I thought when we did the second collaboration, adding her horses in this fetus position, and I'm adding the cicadas, I thought it was done. But then uh, my gallery, a Westwood Gallery staff showed up and said, hey, Noby, come to Broadway. We have a big wall for you. And you can change the image, Karen, just to show the context. And I'm not a painter, and all of a sudden, I had this incredible large wall. I had never painted a mural or something like this kind, but as you can see, I brought a series of stencils which shows the different stages of the cicada, which made me possible to work really fast. And luckily, it was the day of the winter or the summer solstice. So I worked from 8 till 9 p.m., and at the end of the day, on three locations, I had 109 cicadas kind of swarming um, in three different locations. And I chose this number and I stopped with 109 because 108 is actually the number of gongs that's rung in Japan at the end of the, uh, the New Year's Eve. And there are 108 temptations that a person must overcome to attain a better life. So I thought there's no way of going back to normal. We have to move on. So adding one more and make it 109 cicadas, I thought, you know, this would complete the three areas of Nero. And I think the storefront reflected all the complexity of the feeling of grief over the death and unease over the you know, loss of jobs and anger over racism. But at the same time, it also 
brought many hopeful images. And I think this was the first kind of a mural that people had access to and everybody was able to join. And I think it was telling the truth. And I'll just end with one quote by a photographer. He said, looking at the plywood made it seem almost like you were looking at the top of a plain pine coffin. And he said, looking straight down as if it was being lowered into a grave. And I'm gonna stop right there. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Novi. All right, our next artist is Haradina Pendle. A distinguished professor of art brings a powerful voice for social justice to her pioneering conceptual art. She utilizes gridded, sterilized imagery along a surface texture a lot throughout her work, addressing issues of racism, sexism, homelessness, AIDS, xenophobia, and apartheid. And a side note is Professor Pindle has a major solo exhibition that just opened at The Shed in New York City, and we're very proud of you. So again, Haradina. Thank you. Uh, Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter is a group that started in 2013 and grew around the world after George, George Floyd was killed by a policeman in 2020 and also the death of Brianna Taylor earlier in the same year. My current exhibition is at The Shed, an art center in Manhattan at 545 West 30th Street. The exhibition includes my new film, Rope, Fire, Water. I also include several issue related paintings with text such as Columbus and about abstract works as well as well as it, it they're so beautiful that it, it's a kind of healing that one feels after seeing the gruesomeness of the uh, video. You need tickets to get in to control the number of people allowed in the space, but the space itself is gigantic. Its ceilings are 119 feet high. If you look up the shed online, you will find the number where you can call and get tickets. It's free until October 31st, uh, and after that it's $10. The new work for the exhibition took three and a half years to complete. The film is 16 minutes long. The abstract paintings help you to realign yourself and step back from what you have just seen. One does not forget, but one can step back from the, the raw emotion by viewing the, and I call it extreme beauty of the paintings. The beauty of the paintings help give us a sense of a pause, some space to think. So far, the exhibition has received two positive articles in the New York Times and Time Magazine. Because of our current turbulent situation in the country, this exhibition with very tough subject matter is, is accepted rather than pushed away. The feeling, we can no longer feel the feeling that everything is fine. Oh, you caught me writing notes. Yeah, I made it short. Anyway. That's, that's okay. You know what is, uh, you can't see me. Well, you can't see me. You can't see inside my head. I am just processing all this. I, okay, I gotta, let me get back to, I wanna facilitate. All right. Our next artist, lecturer and undergraduate director, Lorena Salcedo Watson, creates large scale drawings and prints that focus on the relationship between structures, and essential qualities of life forms. Based on a fascination with human anatomy, botany, entomology, her imagery transforms and reinterprets aspects of nature, filtering through personal experiences, observations, and the imagination. Lorena. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Thank you, Karen and Georgia, uh, for coordinating this. Um, I will keep it sweet. Howard Dean is always a tough act to follow. Um, <laughs> uh, these drawings are uh, developed uh, from my perceptions of the insecurity that we are being confronted with during the pandemic. Um, I wanted the work to reference uncertainty about the future and feelings of isolation, fear, and caution. The images, the images suggest a loss of gravity. Human potential is analogous to seed pods floating in space, holding the potential for germination. When planning these images, I thought about the Svalbard Global Seed Vault in Norway. And this seed vault preserves plant seeds in an attempt to protect against the loss of seeds during large scale global crises. The seed vault represents over 13,000 years of agricultural history protected in the permafrost. The wisdom of seeds being protected for the future, for an unknown future, is a forethought that all of the world needs to have to ensure survival. It requires preparation and vigilance since the viability of certain species is threatened by climate change. These images in particular deal with the precious responsibility of preparing seeds for the future. During this time, I have felt the loss of control in limbo, floating, preoccupied with creating a protective environment against the threat of danger. Um, limbo is the image on the left, and in this drawing, I'm trying to reveal the frailty and complexity of the network of the seed pod, revealing the seeds within floating without a ground on which to germinate. And in the image on the right, floating, hoping, um, I want to describe the delicate complexity of the sheltering seed pod uh, with its protective yet defensive structure yielding and releasing its seeds to an unknown space in the hope of germination. In these drawings, uh, the negative space, I wanted to create an aura suggestive of a photographic solarized image to evoke a surreal sensibility. Um, and these drawings are done uh, with charcoal on paper and they're large scale. Um, and I have them behind me. I wanted, a lot of my drawings are really about you confronting the space or really it being larger than life. Um, and it's done with a subtractive technique where the, the full sheet is covered with black. And from that density, I worked to erase these delicate filaments, which is really a bit tricky on uh, a broad surface. Um, but it, it, was, it was very labored and I really wanted to get a sense of this wonderful and delicate lacy protective layer um, and really transfer that sensibility of a lot of people feeling trapped and waiting, um, especially young people. We were in the middle of, of transforming how we teach and how we reach out to our students, how they're trying to be protected in their environments, yet feeling a bit trapped. Um, and that felt like it went on and on. And with um, the solarized quality, I wanted to get that black aura. In photography, um, if you're in a dark room and somebody opens the door and exposes the uh, developing paper to light prematurely, this really surreal aura forms. And I wanted to really amplify that sense of floating with the unknown. Um, the image on the right came after, and those are detura seed pods, and they're really spiky. And really, I wanted to think about the sense of how long do we wait before we feel it's safe to proceed. And um, with this one, I'm releasing the seeds and trying to go forth while the environment is still surreal. And with this one and the bottom fell away, uh, this was a little bit different. I started it earlier and I wanted to, I was inspired by a sense of deep loss uh, and disappointment, which was amplified by the pandemic and the sense of disorientation. Um, and I wanted the image to really depict this profound space that I felt opening up in my core. So my spine is often used as my medium of expressing uh, emotion and, and just grief. Um, and so I wanted to draw what betrayal felt like, the sense of living through a solitary but collective trauma. And within the drawing, I have vortices and ammonites uh, 
to suggest an existential crisis. Um, and those forms reinforce a geological history combined with a, a turbulent and aggressive present. Um, and this, basically my sternum is floating up away from my spine and creating a vast void. And it makes me feel like drifting with whatever support I believed having fallen away. So that's where the title came from, and the bottom fell away. Um, and I felt that floating out of control sensibility, and I wanted to just like put it, put it on paper. Thank you. Thank you so much. That, oh, I can't wait to ask follow-up questions. So let's go to our next artist. Associate Professor of Music and Art Department Chair, Margaret Chadell is the interdisciplinary artist blending classical training in cello and composition with sound, audio, data research, and innovative computational art education. Her work spans interactive multimedia opera, virtual reality experiences, sound art, video game scores, and composition for classical instruments or custom controllers with interactive audio and video processing. Margaret. Thank you so much. So first I'd like to apologize. My internet is out, so I'm only audio, which is somewhat appropriate as I am a sound artist. Uh, so in sound art, it is work that engages with audio outside of the concert hall. And it doesn't even have to make audible sound, in my opinion, for something to be sound art. Uh, this piece, the Brum Line, engages with the reckoning uh, concept in two ways. So first, it brings attention to the sound of our environment. So um, the biodiversity is deep and so is the variety of sounds in our environment. Um, and then the second thing was I wanted to create a version of the piece that could be experienced over the internet. So this is a physical installation um, and we've put it up twice now, um, but since the pandemic occurred, we could not have visitors to, the, um, to, to hear it in person. So I, I wanted to create a way that the audience could still interact with the work online. Um, and so it was successful. And I think that that's a little tiny positive piece about this pandemic is that we've been able to use technology to become closer together. So people all around the world have actually been able to play the frogs, which has been really exciting for me. And I hope that once we are able to go to things in person that we will continue having the accessibility that the sort of new technology has afforded us. So um the piece has um 18 robot frogs that you can control and a fake head so uh essentially if you have um two ears uh your face actually does math on sound so that you know where sounds are coming from and so by having a fake head with two microphones in it you can precisely locate sound and on the internet site you can actually turn the head um, and you'll hear a different kind of sound when the head turns. We couldn't have, figure out how to make that quiet, but this is very exciting. Um, and I think it relates a little bit to Azumi's piece um, with that idea of invisibility. So this is an instrument that you play uh, before you see it. And that was in the um, in person as well. There was a curtain that covered the visual and then you would play it and then be able to experience it visually afterwards. Thank you. Um, and now there's a little video of it in action. And maybe we're not sharing sound, but it should go and make little sounds like frogs. <laughs> We are looking at it. That's cool. Could you hear it? I was trying to. Yeah, the yes. second time I could. Second time? All right. Do I yeah. need to do it again or we're good? Okay. We're good. Move on. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Margaret.
Now we're our final artist is Maya Schindler, who employs textuality and imagery in ways that reflect on symbiotic, uh, I'm saying symbiotic, semiotic, childhood imagery, popular culture, activism, and art historical references, often using our humor, critique, irony, and introspection. Maya. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for, uh, thank you Dr. Clark, and thank you Karen and Georgia for hosting this, and thank you everybody for coming. So I, um, specifically for this image, um, and generally in my work, I tend to ask questions um, that uh, maybe relates to everybody, um, but also are very much about my own self-reflection uh, um, in my own life and in my own work and things that I very much um, deal with. Um, so uh, this is very timely. Um, um, this is a question and the little blurb that I have about this is that basically there's no question mark needed. And I would like to add that we should just ask for answers, uh, whose land and uh, I would like to encourage everybody, whoever they are, to maybe ask that question is what land they're on and what's the origin of their land and to acknowledge um, what indigenous land they're on because in Long Island, everything is indigenous land, basically. Um, I'm right now in the South Shore of Long Island. I'm assuming most of you, everybody that are here is somewhere in New York or <clears throat> somewhere in the United States. Maybe we have some students that are um, Zooming from somewhere else, but it's interesting to explore. There are many ways to find that information. Um, and I think it's a, it's a good question to ask at this time. Um, but from my background, this is a very important question to me for I'm an immigrant and where I come from, this is also a very important question because land is a very, uh, territory in general is a very uh, is a very important question where I, from my background as well. So uh, it's something that I question and uh, ask about all the time. And in, in the symbols that I uh, deal with, the question that I ask, uh, just like the um, title of this show, I think um, this existential, uh, this show, the title of the show is a very existential title, is something that I, um, deal with in general, it's, a pro it's part of my process. And we talk about, uh, I think Nobi kind of touched upon that. What is an artist process? Um, I think part of the artistic process of every artist is to ask what the audience get from the piece. What is, because um, once the piece leaves the studio, you sort of, you know, it, it sort of starts its own life cycle. Um, and how does, it, it function in the real world. What happens, you know, um, the artist is not there to speak about the piece, right? Uh, what does the artist do? What does, what, I'm sorry, what does the piece do in the world? How does it function in the world? I imagine my pieces, this is what I call a digital poster. Um, and if this was not a digital, a digital show, this would exist as a poster that everybody could take to their house and use it as they wish. Um, so this would stand as a question and you would do with it as you wish. So I think it's interesting to see what people would do with this. How would this function in people's life as a function or as a picture or as a reminder or as a bookmark or as a poster or as a, or as nothing, you know, or as something that you want to forget about something, you know, maybe that would make people feel uncomfortable. And that's okay. I think the times that we're all in, maybe um, we all have to be uncomfortable to get to the next place. This is pretty clear where we're we at. So I think uh, um, I think Dr. Clark started this um, uh, panel by saying that art is the is one of the these cultural event that needs to happen to carry us through this. And I think that's exactly what we're all doing. And we, this is exactly when artists gets to work. I'm not the first one to say that. So thank you.
Thank you. And I thank each of you. Thank each of you artists. Um, because what you're really modeling is our opportunity to really understand that, you know, solutions come from creativity. This is, and, and literally, okay, I'm taking a little, I'm taking some liberty here. I just got off a call where we were trying to put together a grant and, we're tr and we were literally artistically trying to put it together. And what is the feeling? What is the takeaway? How do we inspire? What how are we using our words? How are we laying it out? And so the way that we navigate the now and, and all the hurt and all the impact and this new way in which we're conducting business, who's essential? Who are you to, you know, one thing about COVID, it really shone the light on how, what we value and who we value. And so what I love is your ability through your artistic is to have a conversation and not be there. To sh put your art and it's like, let's have a conversation and I'm going to create a construct for a conversation, but I'm, I won't even be there to have a conversation. You're going to have a conversation with my gift. And I, I appreciate all of you so much. And nobody asked me a question. I don't know why I'm answering. So here's what I'm going to do. I have, in, in, a, in a little bit of time, I have six questions. And so I'm not going to necessarily call on you. You choose what question you decide to answer. And I'll try to make, and everybody will have a chance. So if you answer a question, then you're, you're, you're out to the next five questions. Okay? So one of the questions that I, I, I wonder is, you know, how has COVID in this particular time, pandemic COVID, pandemic racism, pandemic, uh, you know, our, our social economic rhetoric and so on, how is that impacting your artistic expression? Who would like that question? Just speak. How has this time right now influenced in a way that you may not have been influenced before? How has that impacted your art this time? Who would like to take that? I'll choose you if you don't choose yourself. Haradina. Well, I think that my work has become two extremes in terms of issue-related work with really tough stuff. About racism uh, and then very beautiful stuff to kind of calm down. So they are they work together at the shed show, but it was not that obvious to me uh, until I did the shed show how extreme the issue related work could be in terms of information. There's a lot of text in the paintings that is issue related uh, that are issue related rather. And then the other, I mean, really pushes the envelope in terms of having like texture and glitter. And I mean, it's just almost absurdly beautiful. But together, they give some what a piece, somewhat of a peace of mind because then you can contemplate, sorry, sorry, contemplate what you've seen, and it's very upsetting. And the other makes you kind of, it's almost like a shock, you step back and you can observe the issue with a clearer head without seeing the issue related work as being destructive in terms of it being too much, too much over the top. Anyway, that, that's something I found with the work now. I have to do both, um, but it's, I, I, I don't think I could stand doing just the issue related work because it's so upsetting. Thank you. The next question is when you have a concept in your and, and and I know you process information different as an artist. So when you have when you're experiencing a concept, take me through how you express that through your senses before you put it on your medium. So when you have a concept in your, you know, that you're experiencing. Kind of take us quickly through the process, through your senses as to how you actually, before you um, create your medium. Who would like that question? 
I'll choose you if you don't choose yourself. I could take this one. Um, so I uh, grew up in New Jersey um, in the woods, uh, mountain. And um, I started doing a meditation practice called deep listening. And then when I returned home to visit my parents, I realized that I could actually tell the shape of the pond at the end of the driveway from the sound of the, that the frogs were making and that it changed, it got bigger after it rained. Um, and I really, really wanted to recreate that experience, not just um, the, the sound. I wanted to really recreate that whole listening environment. Um, and so for me, it was just figuring out how to create that multiples of, of that kind of sound. Um, and I was like, all right, I'm going to need motors and something that strikes, but then how to articulate it in such a way that people are forced into that mode of listening before they experience the piece visually. Thank you. My next question is, art is so interactive. You know, even though you create a piece or an experience or a sound or a feeling or a movement, you know, but it's very interactive. So when you think about the collaboration, um, take me a little bit about what, you know, when you think about, you know, creating something that creates the basis of collaboration, what does that look like in your, you know, within your decision making? Who would like that? Nobi, is that you? Nobi, are you taking that one? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, I, I teach currently a course called, um, the acronym is actually CIA, which is a little bit eyebrow raising. It's a community interactive art. And the subtitle is uh, Socially Engaged Art in the Time of Social Distancing. So in my class, you know, in my seminar, I talk about collaboration, how artists at this time of social distancing come together and collaborate. And this particular mural, you know, I think it really came together as artists collaborating. We didn't, we were not giving an assignment of a particular wall. Artists just showed up either at eight in the morning or two in the afternoon. And there was no fight over the size or anything. And it was just a very organic way of artists coming together at the time of social distancing and collaborating. And um, I think it kind of came out really, really beautifully week after week as people heard about what was going on. I even invited my neighbor for instance, who is not an artist, but she just said, wow, we get to do something? Like, I'm not a painter. I've never painted since maybe, uh, you know, uh, I had a class in elementary school and I get to paint something on the wall. And I said, yes, you're welcome to do that. And also, um, one of the reasons I created actually in my work, I didn't explain it, but I created a stencil of a cicada, which is for me, the symbol, I mean, it's maybe going back a little bit to concept to the idea of doing back to your previous question is, it was a ear, the 17 ear cicada emerged from the earth and it was this summer. And then that was a symbolism. And some people didn't know what it was. And in the process of making something on the street, people ask me, what, what is this? Is this a cockroach? <laughs> is this, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, animal, I mean, what kind of insect? And I really enjoy the engagement of the people who ask me questions while you're doing something on the street. And I explained, you know, this is like a transformation from nymph to the adult, and they're kind of spiraling outward and flying and singing and symbolizing resilience and survival and ephemerality and the cycle of the life of the 17 year cicadas who just came out. And during that conversation, I think some people took an interest and said, oh, can I try to put one on? And I really, really welcome that. So in case of this particular work, I think, um, or not just my work, but in this case of this mural painting, 
everybody came as a collaborator and took a stand and took an action. And I think that became a very successful. And I'm not sure that was answering your uh, question. I, I maybe got off the track a little bit. But, nope. but the idea of collaboration was the center uh, point uh, of this particular uh, mural paintings. And I think more and more will maybe hopefully come out in the time of social distancing, a creative way for artists to collaborate with music and theater and, you know, in the digital field and, you know, in a different kind of platform. Thank you. So we still have Izomi, Lorena, and Maya. So here's who one of the three of you will take this question. Every single, you know, I look at your work, it's so profound in messaging and ensuring it's, it's giving inspiration and hope. And then you're so incredibly creative in your expression, the way in which you present it. Walk me through that dance, because that doesn't always necessarily align. So walk me through that dance in your head and your life and so on. It's like, how do you keep that real social or, you know, whatever your platform and messaging is with your artistic expression? Walk me through that. Who'd like that? I'll take it. Okay. Okay. So I think um, one of the things that I, I collect a lot um, and I've, I, I collect insects and I collect seed pods. My garden looks like a disaster area only because I want things to basically live their life out and I make paper. So I, I harvest all sorts of plants to recycle and put in there and, and give it uh, an echo of its former life. So I think part of, I might do what Nobi did. I'm not sure if I'm gonna end up answering your question, but the process that I find is important is slowing down and observing and pondering uh, the subject, the approach, the material that I want to use to express that. Um, I think research is a big part of it to really get an understanding for what it is I'm looking at and what I am trying to speak what I'm trying to use to speak in terms of, to convey my joy, my, my anxiety um, with this particular time, um, I actually really didn't feel like making work. I felt overwhelmed. I felt a, 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 a oppressive responsibility for the safety of myself, my family, the well-being of our students. Um, and I really felt like cocooning in because we were physically doing that. Um, and I've got imagery that is in my head, like that's been there that just needs time to come out. And I think I, I like to figure out how do I make you feel or think about what I'm feeling and how can I convey that, um, you know, with that blackness, with that frailty um, and really trying to have an, uh, an enjoyable time drawing. I love to draw. So part of my imagery is really getting to know what my subjects are and then transforming them and putting in into surreal spaces um, because drawing what you see is wonderful and fun, but I'm not saying anything about it. So I'm, I'm, I basically need to transform it so that I am actually pushing it in a direction that will make you feel imbalanced or make you feel like you're in love or make you feel like it's a hostile um, situation. Uh, but basically it's my translation of it. Um, yeah, I don't know if I've answered your question. <laughs> Sorry. You did. And then I'm gonna let Karen, um, we've got um, Azumi and Maya who haven't had, asked a question yet. And then there's a, a question in the Q and A. So I'm gonna hand it over to you now. Okay, thank you. First of all, a huge thanks to Dr. Clark. That was really, really interesting questions you had for the panelists and a big thanks to all of the artist panelists um, for your amazing artwork that I've admired for a long time and I always enjoy seeing more of so uh, and hearing your discussion. So thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A and then if we um, don't have more, we can turn it back over to you, uh, Dr. Clark, for, the, for your other two questions. Um, the first question is for um, Nobi, for Professor Nagasawa from Chris Sang. So Nobi, um, 
There are many murals in Soho and they've become backgrounds of Instagram posts. What is your opinion on that? Do you think the murals and specifically your piece are meant to be the background of pictures or should they be viewed by themselves alone? Does the meaning of the art change when it is part of a picture? Noby, you're muted. Okay, uh, am I? Yeah? You're good. Okay, uh, I personally don't do any social media. I, I just don't, um, but I think, um, any platform where people can see what was going on, I think it's fine. And, but I think when you go to the actual site and see the people participating, you know, you feel a kind of a different kind of energy and you are part of that whole streetscape where the street is telling the truth. And the conversation that happens when you are actually there, I think it's very encouraging. But I'm sorry, what was again the question? I mean. Could you, I, I'm not sure, I'm trying to be short. The question, is, the question was, if your artwork is background for an Instagram post or yeah. other picture, you know, do you feel that that takes away from it or do you think that it's meant to be, that it's okay to be the background of someone's Instagram post? Well, yeah, uh, I, I don't create my work as a background of Instagram or I don't, I don't even, I don't think that way. I don't even think, you know, it's, it's a backdrop, like a theat theatrical backdrop. I think the action itself is for me important, but you know, uh, if people are, a lot of people are putting, I mean, we were all supposed to put their signature and that was something that it was uh, asked to do. And a lot of the people actually put their Instagram at whatever, you know, or hashtag something. And since I don't have an account or don't do Facebook or Instagram, I, I just didn't have anything to put in, so I just put my name on. So I think, you know, everybody have a different purpose. And some of the young artists, they want their art to be on a broader platform. So I think it's, yes, definitely acceptable for them to have uh, their artwork to be seen on a different social media. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so the, the other, the next question is for anybody. So perhaps uh, one of the, one of the artists who hasn't answered one of Dr. Clark's questions could answer this one. Um, it's from Eunice Kim and the question is, for any of the professors, how did you interpret the title of this exhibition, Reckoning, and how did you choose which one of your works to share? I can answer that. My um, if you want. Um, well, Reckoning is, is uh, to me, is something that I do all the time. It's kind of like a summarize of things, right? It's almost like a QED in a way, right? Um, at least that's what I think Reckoning is. Um, and we actually had um, uh, an email discussion about it uh, between the faculty about the title of the show, which I thought was interesting um, and timely. And um, I think most at least I did, uh, this work was specific for the show. So this work was a, almost like a site specific for this show. I made this work specifically for this show. Uh, for the time where we are right now and for um, this specific, specific platform, which is an online show. But um, I think if, time, if the times were different, I would probably make a completely different show, a, a completely different piece, so. It's, it's specific for this show and for the context. Hopefully that answers that. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so the next question is uh, from Tali Hinkis and it is, where do you think art and art venues will be in the short and longer term in New York and Long Island? I don't know if, um, so if, Howard, Diana, did you want to answer that? Can you unmute, unmute yourself? There we go. Okay. I think that, oh, how can I explain it? Ask me the question again, because I got a complicated answer. Okay, the question was, where do you think art and art venues will be in the short term and the longer term in New York and Long Island? Okay, it's kind of complicated because each institution, both galleries and museums, 
have made several decisions. Some of them are closed and giving virtual tours. Uh, some of them are open, but you have a certain amount of people allowed in. Um, some of the galleries, I think, are open down in Chelsea, again with uh, limited access. But I'm not sure the museums like the Met, I think the Met also can only have like 25% capacity. I think the modern is all, always, um, is now rather open. So it's like each institution, it's not like there's a blanket way to handle it. Each institution has their approach. So the best thing to do before you go to a, a, an exhibition, call in advance and find out whether they are giving a virtual tour and again, how do you hook up with that to see what's there or whether you can come in in kind of a staggered, um, the people staggered in time to avoid any uh, overlap. So you, you almost have to think of the institution you would like to go to and then call them and find out how they're handling it. Thank you, Haradina. And just as a follow up, I think that a lot of artists and art venues are doing a, a lot of really creative work to make their work uh, to get out there. And um, um, Meg Shadell mentioned this as well as, you know, using technology and innovation has been one of the positive things that's come out of this. And I think that a lot of artists and a lot of our venues have really taken advantage of that and hopefully will continue to do that to, to do, uh, to make art, you know, accessible more globally. And then there's also been a lot of venues who have done, you know, outdoor exhibitions and that kind of thing to make it a safe environment. So I think that, you know, there are creative ways that it's getting out there. Um, we have a question uh, for um, Lorena. So this is from He uh, Chen Hu. Uh, says to Professor Salcedo Watson, why did you choose to incorporate symmetry into your work and the bottom fell away? The spine divides the composition into two roughly equal parts and you include two ammonites in each part. What would be the role of symmetry in a highly asymmetric situation of betrayal? Thank you. Okay, thanks for the question. Um, it's funny that you would say that. I really find this to be really kind of asymmetrical. There's a balance in the fact that we can partition ourselves and that I am delaminating. Um, I mean, we, we've got that perfect, uh, that, that ammonite and, and, I'm, and I'm shifting perspectives and really trying to torque the space so that you don't feel like you have a solid footing. Um, why am I using symmetry? Because it's part of nature, because there is a, a grand symmetry throughout. But part of what I was really trying to do was to sort of tip the space and really pull away any, any sense of structure. Um, so yeah, it's inherent, but I tried to mess with it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, whoops, I keep on flipping that accidentally. All right. Uh, okay, so I think we have two comments for our last um, responses from the audience. Um, and I just want to read those both. One is from Professor Barbara Frank, who says, uh, no question, just a comment. It's a privilege to be a member of such a fabulous community of artists and thinkers. Well done. So thank you all for that. And I also then want to um, have a question or a comment from a student, Kiana Lam. And, oh, my background is better. Um, says, I don't have a question, but I have a comment to make. I, I really appreciate the sensibility of all the art, all the artists showed and their commentary on how they've been dealing with these times, particularly as a student. I really appreciate Lorena's planting seeds for the future in a literal sense and on a metaphorical level as her student. Um, Judith Brown Clark, thank you for being such a strong role model and athlete. <laughs> thank you. And I think that, um, Dr. Clark, if you want to have the last word, and I just, again, want to thank all of the artists and all of the um, uh, participants for your great comments and questions, and um, I'll let Dr. Clark have the last word. I think the, um, you know, we are so aligned in what I do and what you do. You, I mean, again, you know, really trying to create hope 
fairness, equity, policies, funding, recognition, um, and in large systems really is, you know, I, I'm an artistic policy person. <laughs> and so I so value what you do. I wish you were all in my meetings to kind of help create these really robust and, and creative ways of solutions, but really in a way in which they're not so focused on what is, what is wanted, but they're more focused on what is needed. And who is the audience that's consuming it? And I think, you know, as an artist, you do that so beautifully. And I wish that was happening more within, you know, a leadership uh, role. But I will say that it is, I wouldn't be anywhere else on the planet than here with you. I enjoyed listening to every single one of you. This is such an honor for me. And you see that I have a right and left brain. So I have my father's analytical brain and my, my mother's artistic creative brain. And so you are in that side of my head right now. And it has just been my honor for you to see me as your colleague right now. And I appreciate you. We need you. I cannot um, say how important it is, respectively, your art is healing. You know, whether you see the patient or not, I see them. Your art is healing, and, and I say as a representative of the campus community and the community at large, thank you. Thank you again. Um, just a, one more note, I just want to uh, mention that this is being recorded. It'll be posted on our website, and also I hope everyone can join us for our next uh, Reckoning Salon Artist Talk with six additional faculty member artists on November 18th at 12 o'clock. Dr. Clark will be moderating that panel as well. And I hope that you have a chance to check out the faculty exhibition and student digital mural websites uh, for Reckoning. They both can be found on our website at zucaregallery.stonybrook.edu um, or on the u.stonybrook uh, slash Reckoning 2020 um, websites. Thank you again, everybody, and take care. Thank you. Thank you.